exciting to see you all. Thank you so much for coming. So in this session, um, we are going to try and dispel some of the myths that surround careers and jobs in data science and in digital, and data science and digital, in the hope that we can convince more people to come into the area and have a much richer, um, more diverse, more inclusive workforce. So I'm Kerstin Dale, Principal Fellow for Data Science at the Met Office, and I'm here with Kate Royce, the Director of the Hartree Centre, and together we're going to host this panel um, to d and discuss what it's like to actually work in data science and digital. So in a minute, I'm going to introduce the panel, or rather, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Um, we're then going to have, uh, I'm going to ask Erin a couple of questions. So I'm so delighted Erin's joined the panel. Erin wrote a really amazing report for the Turing Foundation on where are the women. So we're going to ask her a couple of questions. And then we will move to the main section where we'll be asking questions of the panel about what it's really like to work in data science. So our hope here is that we, we can draw back the curtain on data science and digital and say that not only can women work in this area, but women do work in this area and we have really exciting and interesting and fulfilling careers in the hope that um, our workforce in the future will be more inclusive and diverse. So to kick off, Kate, who are you? What do you do? <laughs> and what did you want to be when you were 10? So, um, so uh, as Kirsten's already um, explained, I'm Kate Royce. I'm the um, Centre Director for the Hartree Centre. I've been working at the Hartree Centre for a year now. Before that, I was the Chief Digital Officer at the British Geological Survey. And what did I want to be when I was 10? Well, I wanted to be a ballet dancer. I was full <laughs> spurred ahead, tutus, pink satin shoes. Aww. Unfortunately, I have no balance, so that <laughs> ended that career ideas very quickly. So we're going to interest the panel long. So Erin. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Erin Young. I work on the Women in Data Science and AI project, which sits within the public policy program at the Alan Turing Institute. And I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And actually, very strangely, I also wanted to be a ballerina. I, don't, I wonder if this will be uh, the common answer <laughs> when I was younger. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mary Gregory. I'm a Deputy Director at the Office for National Statistics in the Data Science Campus. Um, I did not want to be a ballerina. In fact, I had no career plan when I was 10, and I pretty much have no career plan now, but it's turned out all right. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Yushin Chu's, the Director of eRepublic Centres, and so delighted to be here. Um, I have special interest in healthcare social robotics. Um, when I was 10, I would like to be an extra boy, which is a Japanese robot, <laughs> 150k fire hose, and with a, you know, AI capabilities that can distinguish bad guys or evil guys. So Astro Boy, Google it, you will enjoy the cartoon. <laughs> I'm not Astro Boy now, <laughs> but working with robots. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Hannah Brown. I'm a senior scientific software engineer at the Met Office. I work in the informatics lab in the data science research team. And I'm very embarrassed to say this, but I've already admitted it to some of the panel. Uh, so when I was 10, I wanted to be a wag. <laughs> Those of you that don't know what that is, it's a footballer's wife and girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> Hannah, we need to talk. You have not read the brief. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Becky Mitchell. I'm the chief exec of Quantera Systems. Um, it's a startup that focuses on ecosystem monitoring as a service, notably focusing on carbon flows and water flows in nature-based solutions projects. Um, when I was 10, I wanted to be an adult, so I can justifiably say I made it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and probably think more about providing help in careers education so that kids have more aspiration than just adulthood. Hey everyone, I'm Torty, and I am doing a PhD in computer science at Turing Institute and the University of Bristol. And when I was 10, I wanted to be a postman on paper, but realistically, I think all I really wanted to do was win X Factor. So. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, but not least, is Louise online. Hi, I'm Louise Butcher. I'm a data scientist at the Hartree Centre, where I've been for about six years now. And when I was 10, I wanted to be an astronaut, until I think I realised it was probably a lot safer to keep my feet on the ground and I could do just as interesting <laughs> things there. Okay, so what did I want to be when I was 10? Okay, so when I was 10, I either wanted to be a fighter pilot like my dad, which is very cool, 
or um, I want her to be Margaret Thatcher. Now, in my defence, <laughs> she was a scientist who was somehow ruling the country. So I'm thinking, that's pretty girl power. So, you know, not so bad. OK, so thank you, and welcome to our panel, and welcome to everyone who's come to join us. We're really excited to have this conversation. So what prompted Kate and I to arrange this session? I think the main thing, speaking on your behalf, feel free to interrupt. Um, the main thing was our lived experience, what it's really like to work as a woman in data science and digital environments. But then also I was reading more and more reports about um, the lack of diversity in data science and digital and what this might mean for the future and for the quality of the work that comes out of the area. And I was thinking, oh, we really should do something. Hence, um, I'm delighted that we've managed to organise this panel to talk about it. So one of the reports that I read was um, the Turing's report, Where Are the Women?, which is a fantastic report, and I really recommend it to everybody. And I'm so delighted that we've got one of the authors on the panel. So I'm going to ask Erin a couple of questions about the report. So Erin, why did you write the report, and is there really an issue? Yes, so um, just to give a bit of background on the project uh, on which I'm a research fellow at the Turing and then I can explain a little bit um, of why we decided to write the report. So um, as I mentioned, I work on the Women in Data Science and AI project in the Public Policy Programme with Professor Judy Wiseman, who is uh, also a co-author of the report and is here. Um, and we, we conduct data science and social science research aimed at informing policy measures to increase equity in the AI field. So what this means in practice is we work with industry and government and civil society to tackle the multifaceted ethical, economic, governance related issues stemming from inequalities in, in AI and data science. Um, we wrote the report for many reasons, but the, one of the main reasons was when we began the project, we quickly realised that there were various gender data gaps, particularly around um, understanding women's careers in the AI space. You know, we know the high-level figures, which are low, so around 26% of the global AI workforce are women. This drops to 22% in the UK. And then even lower if we think about um, engineering and cloud computing, which are 14% and 9% respectively. But we didn't really understand or have data around kind of what's actually happening, the dynamics of, of what's happening in women's careers in the space. And so we wanted to explore the demographics in order to understand what's happening and therefore be able to tackle the issue and design the right kinds of interventions to, to help. And Erin, why does it matter that there isn't as much diversity as you might want in AI and data science? So, I mean, it's obviously an ethical issue uh, of social and economic justice. But I think one of the most worrying things, particularly when we're thinking about AI and data science within STEM, is that this underrepresentation of women and marginalised groups in the space alongside various data issues it's creating this feedback loop which is shaping AI bias alongside other issues to do with uh, responsible AI, governance of AI, AI safety, which is then harming those in particular not involved in the design and development of these technologies, so notably women and marginalised groups. Um, you know, women are about 50% of the population, but as I mentioned, about only 26% of the global workforce. So clearly a, a big issue that needs tackling urgently. Mm. And as women who work in digital and data science, what, what sort of thing can we do? Is it important that we share our experiences? Please say yes, because we've arranged <laughs> 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 yeah, Absolutely. I mean, there's, a, there's many different things, um, but one of the, the most important things we found in research shows is to be visible in the space and to provide accessible role models if you're already working in STEM or tech or AI and data science, um, because these role models can then inspire girls and women right from the beginning of the STEM pipeline. Um, I think as well, if you're in a position to be able to mentor or champion other women in the space, that's also very key. So yes, it's very important. So thank you so much for organizing this panel. It's been an awkward moment. <laughs> <laughs> right.
Okay, so the keen-eyed of you will have noticed that I've got a cocktail shaker. Everyone else has water, but I have a cocktail shaker. Cocktail shaker is for Kate and me. It does not contain cocktails, sadly. sadly. does contain questions for the panel. So what we've put together is a load of questions that we are asked regularly from all sorts of um, people from all sorts of levels of their career. And the panel are going, so this is the first question, and this is to Mary. What one piece of advice would you give to someone wanting to pursue a career in digital? Great question. I mean, I think the main piece of advice I'd give is don't hold yourself back because I think especially women often think they don't have all the skills on the advert or whatever it might be. I'm sure you would have seen some of this. Um, and so often, therefore, you think you won't even apply. And I think to make sure you don't hold yourself back is the biggest thing. It's then in your control. Right, so the next question, they're all looking quite nervous because they don't know what question I'm going to pull out or who, who I'm going to pick on. It's like power, I love it. So this is for Torty. Uh, would you recommend a career in digital? Yeah, I mean, if I said no, that'd be a bit bad start, would it? <laughs> um, absolutely, I think the beauty of working in digital is that most jobs these days are going to have some sort of digital they are branched to them, and there's such a beautiful variety of jobs that you can end up doing, which means that you're inevitably going to end up working with incredibly cool people who have such a wide background of expertise, and that is why I love doing what I do. But I think it's important when you're looking to work in digital is to find a job that suits you rather than looking for a job that you think is the, you know, that dreaded job where you wake up on a Monday morning and you're like, I hate my life. But the beauty about digital is that you can find jobs where, you know, if you want to go live on a beach in Indonesia and work, that you can do that with uh, digital. If you want to start your own company, if you want to work flexible hours, you can do that with digital. And that's what I particularly love about our area. So, same question to Bex. So I would, yeah, I, I, I would also, thankfully, recommend working in digital. And I agree that um, most jobs now, or at least most workplaces, have an increasing requirement for people in digital and data, data science. Um, I think it's a very broad spectrum of roles that can exist, though, and I think uh, in terms of thinking about what a job in digital might actually mean, there's a huge array of skills and capabilities that, that span those huge array of jobs and roles. And so I think maybe um, if, I was, if somebody was to ask me, would I recommend a job for them, I would say, I think you need to think more about what you really mean by a job in digital and data science so that you can be more focused in trying to tailor how that might work. Right, so. Oh, they're, they're looking equal, they're getting more and more nervous now. So, what do you enjoy about your role and what are the challenges and how do you overcome them? And I'm going to go online and ask Louise. Okay, thanks for asking that, that's a good question. Um, where I am and what we do at the Hartree, which is working with a lot of different external companies, I would have to say the best thing about the role is the variety. Um, getting to work in so many different fields with all sorts of different um, people and technologies. Um, so at the moment, looking at something in healthcare, something in utilities. And I guess even if you're not working somewhere like this, this external facing, there are lots of different opportunities across data science to work in all sorts of different industries. Um, but I guess that variety is also the challenge for me. Um, I, you know, my expertise is in data. I can't hope to become an expert in every single technology we work with and everybody's business and industry. Um, so that becomes quite challenging because you start off a project not knowing you know, where you're going with this or understanding the background. And I think the way of overcoming that, I've found, is just to, to talk to a lot of people who understand their own field, find out what's important, what's been missed, um, you know, who are the, the important stakeholders to talk to, to get more, more women and uh, marginalised groups involved, um, to make sure you bring in all the knowledge and all the right people and, and skills. Um, but I think that is the great thing about data science, the, the vast variety of, of areas you can get into. Thanks, Louise. I'm, I was just wondering, um, Mary, whether you've found the same things in terms of challenges within your role. 
Um, absolutely. It sounds similar in terms of the variety of things we cover. So in the data science campus, I could cover anything from um, building capability across government or looking at health or looking at privacy enhancing technologies. Um, but I think similarly, I really love that variety. Um, so I see that as a positive. But I think overall, what I love is that ability to try and help people's lives. So I feel really privileged that I'm doing that in government because there's such a potential to make a difference. Yeah. It is, it is fantastic. Oh, I think that's really important, actually. I remember I've been reading lots of reports about this, obviously, in preparation for the panel. And one of the reports I was reading about what, what stops girls going into data science, so they seem to sort of bleed out uh, around about sort of A-level time. What, what stops them going into computer science, for example? And I think one of the things that they really struggle with is um, not being able to see the value of it. I'm really sorry, this is going to be a bit of a shocking moment for everybody, but data science doesn't have a great image. Um, it <laughs> tends to look a little bit nerdy, a little bit nerdy. And um, I think one of the challenges for us is to show how data science and digital can benefit and deliver real societal impact to the world, which I wholeheartedly believe. You know, I work for the Met Office on climate change with Hannah, so yeah, obviously I believe that this is part of the solution to some really big societal problems, and I think it's really important that we talk about that, so I completely agree, Mary. So, so this is to... Hannah, what can the wider data science community do to help other women in the area who are wanting to join? Good question. I think um, actually one of the things um, that was picked up when everyone was chatting earlier was around kind of acting as role models and showing that there are exciting opportunities within this field to kind of, yeah, people to grow into and kind of create a career. Um, and I think even kind of starting really early and creating kind of a pipeline of, mm. uh, yeah, I guess opportunities and talent and whatever you want to call it. Um, so, yeah, going into kind of school level and showing them actually if you're studying maths or if you like science at school, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go on and become a physicist or you have to become a, a chemist. Actually, there's other ways that you can kind of draw on those interests and kind of, yeah, create a, a slightly different career. And I think similarly, kind of not closing off that door for people to join later in their career. You don't have to be a data scientist right from the start. It's kind of a career that you can grow into and kind of gain the skills. Through other I ways. think that's very true, don't you? Because a lot of the people that I'm employing now, the jobs I'm asking people to come into, AI, quantum engineers, um, data scientists didn't exist when I was at school and certainly didn't exist possibly even five, six years ago. So just because you didn't train in that specifically, there is always those opportunities to retrain and particularly in the digital, um, we do a lot of work and we need to do more work about encouraging mid-careers to start thinking about different types of things that they could do. Yeah, definitely. And there are conversion courses available. So anybody who's sitting out there who's thinking, I'm not a data scientist, but this sounds really good. There are courses <laughs> out there just for you. So there are always routes that you can get into data science at whatever stage in your career. Do my bit to plug education there. <laughs> Go for it. No, I don't work for a university. So what about um, <laughs> Etsin? Um, what would you do to help other women into data science? All right. Um, echoing what Hannah just mentioned, I think to set up a community like this mm -hmm. is brilliant initiative, widening. You know, um, I applied last two years. I applied a grant from British Council to set up um, a pie for women in Steam H for healthcare staff, nurses during COVID, mm -hmm. to train them, um, to expose them to you know, data science, to AI, to robots. I think that that's helped a lot to bring that sense of community support mm -hmm. where I'm not, I'm not saying a, a kind of a tick boxes yeah. uh, exercises, but it's really um, women's helping women, uh, including men's helping women. Yeah. <laughs> so that sense of community, of peer support, and it's so really rare to see top management, senior management in, in women. I mean, there's more in this country maybe, but not mm -hmm. maybe not the country that came from Southeast Asia, Malaysia. Mm -hmm. So it's dominantly by uh, male leaderships. So how do we provide that um, 
community, sense communities, and it's self-sustainable to each other into data science, into AI, into STEM subjects. I think it's really, really helpful. I think that, that uh, I, I really like that um, community support. Um, one of the things that has worked particularly well at the Met Office is to set up a community of practice and having um, different people working in the field come together to support one another and, and to challenge one another, but also to share best practice. That's worked really, really well for us. And it also has in, um, encouraged a more diverse range of people deciding to work in data science. So that's been a big success think, for us. I think it's a really good point, though, that every single one of you that works in data science, AI, quantum, you are all role models to people coming up into the profession and to not shy away from sharing your experiences and shouting about your roles in your jobs and what you do. I think it's really important. I think people feel embarrassed about talking about their jobs too much, but we really shouldn't. I think some of the stuff that we do, I can see Dorothy laughing. Yes, <laughs> this is you led off with that there's jobs in Indonesia. I was thinking, jobs in Indonesia? Nobody told me this. I could work on a beach. <laughs> beach. <laughs> Two months in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, think, I think there is a responsibility on uh, women in dates ones to, to talk a bit about what you're doing and about the impact it's having. Because, like I say, I think, well, it's not just me, other people have published reports on it. Uh, data science has this image problem. And the only way we're going to get over that image problem is to talk about it and to do things like this, like drawing back the curtain and saying, this stuff is really exciting, really interesting, and we're having a really fun time doing it. And to try and show that it is going to be more inclusive, that it is going to be more diverse. And we need a broad range of people who are willing to come into the field. So um, if you work in data science, I encourage you to talk about it a bit more. No. So. Wow. So the next thing I wanted to sort of talk about was whether any of you have had mentors, supporters, and coaches, and how they helped you on your journey. And I wondered, Hannah, if you'd like to kick us off on that one. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, I'm not a huge way into my career. I've only been working for five years and I've had a mentor for four years of that and it has been kind of enormously helpful for me in, yeah, kind of both understanding how I want my career to progress and like what, what opportunities there are for upskilling and learning new things. Um, but also just kind of, I guess, understanding like the working environment, I think particularly as a kind of early career scientist, it, it can feel quite daunting and um, yeah, there's kind of, yeah, I guess kind of a bit of a sense of imposter syndrome and kind of feeling like you're, there's lots of very senior kind of really established scientists that you're working with, but actually recognising how you can draw on that. And I think having a mentor has been a really useful opportunity to kind of, yeah, see, see how I can kind of make benefit of that. Um, yeah. I think it's good. It's an interesting one you talk about imposter syndrome because I think me and Kirsteen will probably say that we're, we're just like you. We might be a bit further on in our careers, um, but we're still human beings and we still think that we're 18. Um, <laughs> well, I do anyway. <laughs> I'm even younger. I'm still like 10, you know. Yeah, I'm still 10, like Margaret Thatcher. So, so, it really is important that you feel empowered to talk about that. I, I saw Torty... I'm a nodding dog, really. Yeah. <laughs> so, Bex, what about you? Have you had mentors? I mean, you, you're working on a startup, so that's quite a different... Quite, and must be quite scary sometimes. Yeah, so um, I guess I've had a slightly muddled career, which I think is... Uh, I started out doing a PhD in applied maths. I was an investment analyst for a while. I worked in the Met Office for a while. I worked at the University of Exeter for a while. And I feel like I've settled now. Being a CEO of a startup, absolutely love it. I love the variation in the light. And I've had different mentors along the way, and they have tended to um, be aligned quite closely to the particular type of organisation that I've been working in at the time. And I think one of the things that has been really helpful from those mentors um, is the fact that they can provide provocation and challenge that make me think, because I'm a pretty capable person, I'd like to think, provide me with the kind of provocation that make me think about what I can do better, but also 
what I might need to do to be happy. And I think that's helped me along the journey to get to the place where I am now, where I feel like actually this is, this is a role I could stick at for a long time as compared to the, many of the others where I've, I've hopped around. The other thing I'd say is that quite a lot of my mentors on reflection have been men of white origin who are about 55 plus. And on, reflect, on reflection, that maybe isn't, isn't an ideal. And so, uh, and so perhaps thinking about how we can encourage greater mentoring and coaching from women, but also other marginalised communities, I think would be something that um, everybody could think about. So I'm going to have a go with the cocktail shaker now. Go on. I have mixed feelings about this. It's both exciting and very disappointing, this cocktail shaker. <laughs> um, all right. <laughs> very much not on the heater. Bit of a look. <laughs> Oh, this follows on quite nicely. I'm going to ask, how do you cope with imposter syndrome? And I'm going to ask a few people. So I'm going to ask um, Hannah, Mary and Torty. So let's go for Hannah first. How do you cope with imposter syndrome? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess, yeah, this follows on quite nicely from uh, the previous statement. I think the thing that I often try and remind myself when I'm kind of feeling like a bit of an imposter is that that's not, you're not the only one who feels that. And quite often you can feel that inside and people don't see that and quite I struggle quite a lot with um or at least it's something I've been working on but public speaking and um often after I've delivered a speech and have been kind of been on the stage shaking in my boots so I will come up on someone and be like oh brilliant talk and I was like I was terrified and they're like you wouldn't know <laughs> um so I think yeah people don't see what you feel inside and kind of just remind yourself fake it till you make it kind of don't let your brain kind of talk you out of something that you're capable of doing. Oh, that is such good advice. And uh, Hannah, well done. You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, uh, where shall I go next? Torty? Yeah, I think everyone's felt imposter syndrome. And if they say they haven't, then they're probably lying. Um, I think, though, in general, imposter syndrome is one of those funny phrases that kind of takes this feeling that everyone feels and puts it on yourself rather than dealing with the fact that there are these external systems that are in place that make groups of people particularly feel like imposters. And if you look at computer science and digital, when I was growing up, it had this sort of stereotype that was like people go into it, you know, if they're good at programming, they love Minecraft. And then <laughs> I, was, I was definitely not that. Um, and that's cool. But then oh, recently it's sort of grown more into this new narrative where it's very sort of tech bro, Silicon Valley. And what I would love to see is us just change the narrative. Let's talk about other people because it's so diverse. And these people, these groups of people, which, which is great, they get so much limelight and there are so many other voices and stories to be told. So, yeah. That's Thank you. My two cents. That was great. Thank you. And, and Mary, I was going to ask you, you about you. I'm going to labour this one a bit because I think this is the question we ask a lot. So we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask a few more panelists. <laughs> Mary, over to you. Not at all. I mean, I feel like an imposter among all these amazing women already. <laughs> um, but I guess two things for me. One and probably most important is I tried to work on things I really care about because that takes out the emotion of thinking about how I feel and makes me really focus on what I'm doing. And I find that helps masses. Um, the other thing is increasingly, and I wouldn't have said this ten years ago. I kind of figure. I am what I am. I've got to be good enough. If I try my best, that's all I can do. And if that's not good enough, then so be it. I'll have to get over it. But I think overall, it's that focusing on things I really care about, because then that takes very much me out of kind of my emotions on what I feel like and more of what I want to achieve. That sounds really great advice. Um, so, like, everybody gets imposter syndrome. Like, I definitely get it. And I think my top tip would be to um, surround yourself with people who can hold you up when you want to fall down. Um, so there's, like, a group that whenever, whenever I'm a bit nervous about something or I'm thinking about, oh, my God, am I really up to it? Then these are the friends that I know that I can ask. And they will be like, no, no, you are totally up to this. I mean, you've got to be a bit careful because you don't want them to go too far the wrong way. <laughs> you end up doing something crazy. But having friends that you trust who are going to offer you good advice and be, be able to hold you up when you, when you need a little bit of extra strength. So, um, Kate, what about you? Imposter syndrome? Well, yes. But definitely a year ago when I walked into Hartree as, as, as their new centre director and everybody looked at me and was like, right, come on, show us. You've got the job now. Um, <laughs> it, it was the most exciting and terrifying thing I'd done 
all at once. But the one thing I would say in life is that you never regret the things that you do. You regret the things that you said no to. So holding yourself back because you're not sure that you could do 100% of the job is never, you're never going to get past that. You can just stay at home and, and sit comfy with a cat on your lap or you can go for it. And I would always say I have never regretted going for things. There is also a whole host of people around you that are always going to help you. No matter where you are in an organisation, there are always people around that can help you. So the other thing that I would strongly recommend is developing your networks. All of you guys out here can form a network together to support each other throughout your careers going forward in whatever you decide to do. It doesn't have to be within the work environment within your organisation that you are, because you might be the only data scientist or the only AI specialist there, and, and quite often that is the case in some of these professions. Um, so reach out, use LinkedIn, use conferences like this to gain networks, to gain people, so that you can feel like you've got people behind you, just like you were saying. Great answer. I wish I'd said that. That was a great answer. Okay, next question. Um, do you ex experience discrimination? What and how do you deal with it? So that's a toughie, and I'm going to ask Becky. Um, yeah, I, I guess I have experienced discrimination at times, and I've also uh, probably discriminated under the assumption that I was going to experience discrimination and yet didn't. Um, so, um, so I would say both, both for being uh, a gay female and a, a female, um, both of those things I've experienced discrimination for, and I've experienced that in, in different magnitudes in different places. But I guess the main thing that has got me through it is, to be honest, really simply just to ignore it. And so, um, I don't have any particular meaningful advice to anybody else experiencing that beyond be as resilient as you possibly can to it and try and challenge people when it feels appropriate to but also be aware of when you're trying when you're unwittingly doing it yourself mm -hmm. it's really good advice i think that actually trees back to the last um, discussion as mm. well so thinking about getting your networks in place so when you do feel like there's a really tough patch and you, you know you feel like you are being discriminated against having um, a network some allies that you can talk to mm -hmm. because they'll tell you if it's not okay and if it needs to be tackled um, so I'm talking I was going to also I just just add something oh, sorry, as well okay. sorry I've just suddenly thought something which was that um, uh, so I've started doing quite a lot of work in the in the US in rural communities where there's lots of cowboys and like actual cowboys <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the things that i found um that has actually helped kind of overcome some some of the discrimination some of these places are um uh relatively uh what i don't know you might call it closed-minded they're not necessarily mm -hmm. as um as, as haven't had the exposure to wide education opportunity and the like and somebody said to me better someone with a closed mind and an open heart than an open heart and an open heart than an open mind and a closed heart and actually treating people as individuals and thinking what what's really motivating them with their discrimination has has helped me kind of get through that sort of thing notably buying cowboy boots for alignment was definitely something <laughs> <laughs> and they look fantastic can i just say um Torty, same question to you yeah no, fantastic question and you know i've got some wild stories that if you catch me at the pub afterwards i'll tell you all but I think there's a difference and there's, you know, there's sexual harassment, there's direct sexism that I, I've experienced, but I think more subversive in computer science is this sort of constant pressure that you have to work a little bit harder to be taken seriously. And I remember being at, at uni in my third year and going to a panel event very similar to this, and there was a female lecturer in the department and she said, you know, if I see a girl who's got a top mark on an assignment, then I will go and check those marks again. And then to hear that sort of vocalised like that by some, an authority figure who was a woman um, was quite wild um, for me. And I think since then, I've noticed in myself sort of adopting these characteristics that aren't really me. My friends don't know me as that, but I feel like I've had to sort of put on this, this sort of mask at work. And I look forward to the day where, you know, all sorts of people, all types of people are uh, welcomed and represented in this community. But you know, I really relate back and just check yourself because then I'm just as guilty as anybody else working in this world that's geared up towards a certain type of person. So yeah, constantly checking yourself 
as well and how could you be better but yeah thank you i guess it's about being sort of mindful of unconscious bias so really mm -hmm. sort of thinking about um how you're treating others as well as what's coming back to you um louise can i can i ask you the same question um, yeah. you, so this was um yeah. how do you experience discrimination uh so do you experience discrimination what and how do you deal with it yeah, I mean, I think in my workplace at Hartree now, I, I don't, um, but I have done in other workplaces in the past working in digital type roles. I think it's got a lot better over the years and it also depends where you are. And uh, do you sometimes find it with external people, um, often the, the 50 something men who just don't expect that a woman is going to be as good as they would, they would hope a man would be. And I think, you know, sometimes that can be quite subtle. Um, one time, you know, um, someone just expecting when we were planning a project out that the man would be the principal investigator, not me. Um, and I think, you know, the way of dealing with these things is just to, to push through it, don't let it get to you as much as you can, or at least not, not openly. And um, just uh, don't give in and just, just push through it. I think also what's really helpful organisationally is working in a culture where uh, male colleagues are very supportive and have been, um, you know, had, had training and um, got used to this through the, the, the culture, um, that they will call other people out as well if they think that they are um, being unfair or discriminatory in, in some way. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I think, uh, like the other panellists say, it's just standing your ground and uh, not, not letting it... Uh, change how you behave. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. Um, Discrimination is not okay. I think it's really important that we tackle it. Um, so I think some good advice from the panel. There. Calling out is really important. If you see a colleague where you feel that the situation isn't right, early calling things out is so much easier to deal with than leaving it to build up because then it becomes a very difficult conversation. And it's the same when people have hidden disabilities. I'm very severely dyslexic. And I thought I could hide it until it was pointed out by a lovely head of HR in my previous employment that everybody knew I couldn't spell because no one could understand a word I'd written in any email. And to the point where actually it was a massive relief just saying, do you know what? I can't spell. So you're going to have to deal with it and you're going to have to interpret and no, I don't know the difference between there, there, and there, but I can spell there at least one way for every <laughs> possibility, and I can guarantee I'll get it wrong. We have to be ourselves, and the more that we can be ourselves in the workplace, the more that we can be authentic leaders, um, I think that will help, and I really do believe that. But it's being, it's being brave enough to be honest about yourself and all your your little squibbles and faults that we all have. On that, would you like to do the next question from the cocktail shaker oh. of excitement? <gasps> the cocktail shaker of dreams. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, what can we do to make it easier for women to work in data science? And I'm going to go to Mary first. Good question. Um, I think there are lots of things we could do, and there are plenty of people who are already doing some of these. I mean, think for me personally, with the child at primary school, being able to finish at three o'clock twice a week is really, really important to me and would be a deal breaker in a job. Um, and I think data, as has already been pointed out, is something that should have the potential to be really flexible. So it should actually be a really great career for women who want that flexibility. Um, and I don't think that's always seen, but there are definitely places where it is. Um, I think one of the things that has benefited me, benefited me most in my career actually is some of the men who have encouraged me to apply for jobs or for, to do things that I might have thought I shouldn't do. So, for example, someone who became my boss, I was having a chat with them and they were asking how long my maternity leave was. I thought, this is a bit odd. And then he went, oh, well, I've got a job coming up and I thought you might want to apply. I was like, well, I'm about to go off for a year. Why would I do that? He's like, that's fine. Just apply anyway, and we'll wait for you if you get it. Obviously, not just giving it. Um, so I think there's things like that that make such a huge difference to how it feels and how to help women progress. Yeah. 
And sometimes that question about, well, how long are you going off for maternity leave? You could have taken it the wrong way, but actually that was somebody there trying to open up the possibilities yeah. and opportunities exactly. for you, which is fantastic to hear. Yeah. Um, who else shall I ask? Becky, what about you? I have a reasonably short attention span, and so I've totally forgotten. So, <laughs> what what would make it easier for women in data science, from your experience? Um, what would make it easier? I think general encouragement. I think um, making sure that people don't put up their own self-imposed barriers, as I think Torty was saying earlier. I think having role models that people can point to. I think having progressive policies for things like parental leave, whether that be for having good maternity leave, but also having supportive parental leave policies for men in the workplace so that they can support women that they might be uh, sharing parental leave with accordingly, rather than just the default expectation that we've got a fantastic maternity leave policy when actually not all women want to take a full year or, or whatever. So I think being open-minded to all the different types of approach that are um, possible never closing one's mind to the idea that there might be new things that could come along, always asking the team, asking other people what's worked for them. I guess, importantly, asking people what hasn't worked for them. Mm -hmm. What are the things that have put people off? Yeah. Um, because I suppose life is challenging. Life in work and outside work is challenging for everybody, whether you're male, female, whether you're from a, a minority background. And it's about talking and bringing those conversations up to make bosses aware of where the difficulties are because they may not actually understand or see it through your eyes even though we perhaps wish they could i don't know whether you yeah, no, have similar I experience i completely agree and i actually think that um for me when when i talk about how it's made me feel there's a, tends to be like a penny dropping moment um with, you know most people <laughs> don't do it on purpose they don't make you feel bad on purpose but, but when i've been talking about um, how some action has made me feel it's they've kind of gone oh god yeah I can see that that'd be really bad I'll try and fix that so for example when I came back from maternity leave which I think was you know a long time ago but one of the hardest things coming back from maternity leave when I came back from maternity leave my boss had given my desk to someone else I was like oh my god where am I going to sit and so I was coming into the office and I was having to hot desk because he'd given my desk away and when I explained to him look you know this is really not okay, you know, I tried to stay calm. This is really not okay. Um, I really need, I need my desk. Um, I don't feel very welcomed. I feel like you've um, replaced me while I've been away and um, this is very much not okay. And you could, I could see the penny dropping for him that it just wasn't the thing to do and that he wasn't helping me come back to work. It wasn't making me feel welcomed. Um, it wasn't feeling like the sort of environment I wanted to, wanted to go back to. So he sorted it out, um, got an extra desk, who'd have thought. Um, and the guy who sat at my desk moved into the extra desk. I got my old desk back. So it was definitely worth talking about it, even though at the time I was a bit... Come back to work, it's, so, it's scary after maternity leave. And, you know, I was a bit like, oh, don't make a fuss. Just, just go in. You, you'll be able to find a desk. It'll be OK. Just don't make a fuss. But really talk about these things. Talk about how you feel. People... I, the vast majority of people are trying to do the right thing, but sometimes they don't always spot it, and they don't don't always they can't always empathise with your viewpoint. So you kind of need to explain it. So I would encourage everyone to be open about how they're feeling about things. Absolutely, about everything, really, isn't it? As as much as you feel comfortable doing it, because as employers, sometimes you're you're being asked to make snap decisions very very quickly. It doesn't mean to say that you've actually taken on board the whole the whole sort of expanse of, of the impact that that decision is going to make. And I'm very lucky. I have some very good um, senior team members that, that can help me think about the impacts that decisions make. Some, some people aren't so lucky. So they, they need you all to be able to feel comfortable doing that. That impact that you had probably made the next five, six, seven women that came back from maternity leave much easier time yeah well it's one of the things that um, i think that we haven't quite got right in different organizations it's great that we're starting to offer paternity leave as well as maternity leave and that this parental leave can be shared this is great but we're not doing enough to think about what it's like to return to the workplace because and i think it's particularly poignant in data science where the field is moving so fast that if you take six months out and you come back in you're like 
oh my God, I, like I can't even program in the same language anymore. So it feels like there is a big old hurdle to be faced by anyone coming back from parental leave. Yeah, but remember to talk to people about it because I know we've brought in um, contact days that we have now. So, so there are lots of different things we can do to help you feel comfortable coming back. And also remember that people have years off, not just for maternity leave. Some people have to have years off because of ill health, um, supporting and caring for other people. You are not alone. Lots of colleagues will have time off throughout their careers and have to come back. As we're sort of moving on with time... Oh, sorry. Oh, no. Oh. I know. So I wanted to go back to Erin, if I may, and say we've talked a lot about the challenges today and we've, and we've heard some fantastic stories about, you know, we're all here, so it, it can't be all bad. So is, do you feel, having done the report, that there is some optimism out there? So firstly, I'd like to say thank you so much for sharing all your experiences and thank you again for organising this. It's so heartening um, to be part of this. So there, yes, there absolutely is cause for optimism, um, even though we've spoken mostly about the challenges today. Actually, since we wrote the report a couple of years ago, the policy paper, um, the number of women in the global AI workforce, at least the estimation, has gone up by 4%, which is very exciting. So it seems to be heading in the right direction. I think one of the things which makes me the most optimistic is we have identified the issues, right? We, we know what's happening. We, we now understand why there are so few women working in data science, AI, what the kind of problems are, particularly for women and marginalized groups in digital. And so now we understand this. We can now work towards initiatives, interventions at various levels. So, um, for example, a, a governmental level, uh, a couple of people mentioned reskilling initiatives and training initiatives. There's money going towards these, which is very heartening. Um, conversion scholarships for women and marginalized groups who weren't in the digital space to begin working in data science later in their career. Those kinds of things are brilliant. Thinking about within industry, there's a variety of diversity and inclusion initiatives, um, which is very exciting. Thinking about how to make the workplace much more welcoming and comfortable for women and minorities is really key. So there's a lot of thinking around that. And then I think at the more kind of individual level, civil society, grassroots level, many of the things we've spoken about today, being a role model, being aware of your own unconscious biases, particularly, you know, women are not one group. We, um, we, are, we are different races, different ages, different ethnicities, um, different abilities. So thinking about that when you're working and navigating your own work, these kinds of things. So I think that the stage is set um, and we are absolutely moving in the right direction. And hopefully events like this, we can all then go out into our own organisations, friend groups, <laughs> anything family and, and talk about this and the problem will be more well known and then we, we, we know how to move in the right direction. So more of these panels, okay, you've been warned. <laughs> There'll be more invitations coming out. <laughs> okay, so we're moving into the last couple of minutes. I'm trying to keep us on time. Um, I'd like to say a few thank yous. Firstly, thank you to the Alan Turing Institute for agreeing to have us run this panel. Um, it's something that we all cared really passionately about and we were so delighted that the Alan Turing Institute agreed to host us. I'd like to thank my co-host, Kate Royce, uh, for stealing my spine. This is something I felt that we needed to do, but um, it's uh, it, it, exactly, as I said earlier, having an ally that holds you up when you need it. So Kate's done that for me, so thank you very much, Kate. And uh, thank you to my amazing panellists, not only for giving your time, but for so generously sharing your personal experience. It's not an easy thing to do, talk about how you personally feel about your work and your job and how you face discrimination. These are personal topics. It's not like you're giving us a talk on some data science project. <laughs> this is actually talking about what it's really, really like to work in the field. So thank you so much for being so generous. I would like to thank everyone who attended today. Um, I hope you found it as interesting as we did 
talking about it up here. And to, I'd like to invite anyone who'd like to continue the conversation with us. We're all going to hang around afterwards. So if, you, if you've got more questions that we've not managed to cover, um, I noticed we've not, we haven't made it to the bottom of the cocktail shaker of excitement. Yeah. So there are more questions we could talk to you about, or you might have some questions of your own that you'd like to talk to us about. But um, I, I'd like to invite you to um, thank my panelists. Thank you.